This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 103, coming up on Space Time. Saturn's rings are disappearing. The mysteries of Ultima Thule. And the Expedition 57 crew finally return home after a trouble-filled mission. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study has confirmed that we're lucky enough to be seeing the majestic world of Saturn at a unique time in its history, with its spectacular ring system about to disappear, at least in astronomical terms. The findings are based on observations originally made by the Voyagers 1 and 2 spacecraft decades ago. Those observations indicate that Saturn's rings could be gone within 100 million years. Apparently, these icy rings are being pulled into Saturn by gravity as particles of ice under the influence of Saturn's magnetic field. One of the study's authors, Dr. James O'Donoghue from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, says current estimates suggest that this ring rain drains the equivalent of two Olympic-sized swimming pools from Saturn's rings every hour. Based on these calculations, the entire ring system will be gone in about 300 million years. Worse still, O'Donoghue believes these rings could disappear much faster than that. He says the Cassini spacecraft detected ring material falling into Saturn's equator at a rate which would see the rings gone in less than 100 million years. Now, although that sounds like a really long time to us mere mortals, it's comparatively short compared to Saturn's 4.6 billion year age. The study's co-author, Professor Tom Stallard from the University of Leicester, says the young age of the rings has some really startling implications. He says it's possible that back during the age of the dinosaurs, Saturn's rings would have been even larger and brighter than what they are today. Something dramatic must have happened around Saturn to make them this large long after the planet formed. The first hints that ring rain existed came from Voyager observations of a seemingly unrelated phenomena. These included changes in Saturn's ionosphere, density variations in Saturn's rings, and three narrow dark bands circling the planet at northern mid-latitudes. The three dark bands appeared in images of Saturn's hazy upper atmosphere, made by NASA's Voyager 2 mission in 1981. The narrow bands are linked to the shape of Saturn's magnetic field. This suggests that electrically charged ice particles from Saturn's rings were flowing down invisible magnetic field lines and dumping water into Saturn's upper atmosphere. The influx of water from these rings washed away the stratospheric haze, making the area appear dark and producing the narrow dark bands captured in the Voyager images. The next phase of O'Donoghue's work will explore how the rings are changing according to changes in Saturn's seasons. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. NASA's New Horizons spacecraft is now all set up for its New Year's Day encounter with the distant Kuiper Belt object 2014 MU69 Ultima Thule. Among its approach observations over the past three months, the spacecraft's been taking hundreds of images to measure Ultima's brightness and how it varies as the object rotates. And those measurements have produced the mission's latest mystery about Ultima. Even though scientists determined back in 2017 that this Kuiper Belt object isn't shaped like a sphere, that it's probably very elongated, potato-shaped, maybe even two objects, that's a mystery in itself. They haven't seen the repeated pulsations in brightness that they'd expect to find from a rotating object of that shape. Periodic variations in brightness during every rotation produce what scientists call a light curve. A New Horizons principal investigator Alan Stern from the Southwest Research Institute says Ultima Thule's light curve is tiny and a real puzzle. Now, one possible explanation for this is that the orientation of Ultima Thule's rotational axis might be aimed either directly at or very close to the New Horizons spacecraft, so the probe's actually seeing this Kuiper Belt object end on. But it's also possible that Ultima Thule is surrounded by a thick cloud of dust, and that dust could be obscuring the light curve in much the same way a comet's coma often overwhelms the light reflected by the central nucleus. The problem is, if this was a coma coming from Ultima Thule, it would require a heat source, and the sun's too far away to provide that. An even more bizarre scenario is one in which Ultima Thule is surrounded by lots and lots of tiny tumbling moons. 
If each moon has its own light curve, then together they could create a jumbled superposition of light curves that make it look to New Horizons like Ultima Thule has a really tiny light curve. The problem with that idea is that there is no parallel to any other body in the solar system, placing it into the unlikely basket. The real answer to this mystery will only become clearer when New Horizons swoops over Ultima Thule, taking its high-resolution images on New Year's Day. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr Fred Watson. New Horizons and its upcoming rendezvous. So New Horizons, to cast your memory back, New Horizons flew by the dwarf planet Pluto back in 2015, the 14th of July, a date that's etched on all the minds of planetary scientists around the world. Because it was such an absolute triumph, the spacecraft basically buzzed Pluto because it was traveling at 14 kilometers per second. There's no chance of stopping it or slowing it to go into orbit. And it, it was traveling that fast because it was one of the fastest spacecraft ever sent out in the solar system. And the reason for that is because it's got to travel further than uh, most of the other ones, or at least in the shortest possible time. So a great triumph in Pluto. We learned lots about the dwarf planet Pluto. And then shortly afterwards, the trajectory was adjusted to allow New Horizons to fly by an object that then was only recently discovered. It was only discovered the year before the Pluto encounter, 2014. Known technically as 2014 MU69, it's now been nicknamed Ultima Thule. I don't think it is yet a form formally approved name. But that name is an ancient name that refers to the furthest possible thing you can know. People used to use it in connection with places like Iceland and Greenland, but now we use it in connection with places on the fringes of the solar system. So to cut to the chase, it is going to pass by Ultima Thule on the first day of 2019. That's, I think, in uh, in UT it's that day, or it may even be US time. We in Australia will probably not see any real results from it or anything like that until the second second at the earliest, 2nd of January, but the flyby is on New Year's Day. And it's interesting because the object in question, Ultima Thule, it's a tiny little, basically, icy asteroid. It's about 30 kilometers or thereabouts across. That's an estimate because it's so far away and so, you know, small in the sky in terms of its angular size that it's very difficult to estimate its size. You can't measure it directly. You've got to do it in terms of brightness yeah, and things be, like that. It'd be almost like trying to hone in on a grain of sand across a continent, wouldn't it? Um, when you talk the distances and sizes of objects. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Amazing. That's a good, an- a good analogy. So uh, it's been in the news actually in the last couple of days because NASA, they're being concerned about the possibility of dust clouds surrounding Ultima Thule or even maybe rings or something like that. Mm. Uh, obstructions, small moons, things of that sort. We believe it does have a moon. But what they've done is they've used the, there's a, basically one of the cameras on board, the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager, or LORI, that's the, it's basically a telescope on board the spacecraft. And they've taken many, many images over the last few days to check whether anything has shown up. Because two weeks out from the rendezvous is the time when you would want to do a course correction. If you've realized that there was a lot of dust around, Yeah. Uh, you needed to avoid, then you do a course correction now, and it means you pass the more safe distance from the object. They've decided that was unnecessary because there's been no sign of any material around Ultima Thule. And so it's basically taking the inside track. It will pass within about 3,500 kilometers, Mm. which is actually a third of the distance that it flew by Pluto. And you remember the detail that we saw? Oh, yes. Pluto images. So this is going to be three times closer. And we should see detail at a level of a few tens of meters. Actually, they're suggesting 30 to 70 meters per pixel for the images that we will see. So all is working well. It's in good shape. The spacecraft seems to have a clear path forward without any kind of risk of collisions with dust particles, because at 14 kilometers per second, a dust particle can do a lot of damage. Yeah. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to what we discover. We really have no idea what this thing will look like. It's it's just an icy, a small icy asteroid. It's probably shaped a bit like, you remember the rubber duck shaped yes, comet? Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, it may well have a similar shape to that because it's thought to be possibly two objects very close together or an elongated object. That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary.
three Expedition 57 crew members have returned safely to Earth after what's been a drama-filled stint aboard the International Space Station. The crew carried out their deorbit burn to commence their descent to Earth two and a half hours after undocking from the space station. Their Soyuz MS-09 capsule touched down on the frozen snow-covered Kazakhstan steppe 55 minutes later, after a total of 197 days in space. With landing uh, scheduled about 25 minutes from now, we are now hearing uh, the uh, beacon, a familiar sound uh, from the Soyuz vehicle that sends out navigational uh, information uh, between the Soyuz and the uh, search and recovery forces at the landing site. What was the maximum G-load? 3.9. Communications has been restored uh, with the crew as we stand by for shoot deploy, reporting that their maximum G-forces were just under 4 Gs. The temperature is in single digits Fahrenheit. As we uh, await the arrival of uh, the Soyuz vehicle, the skies are uh, somewhat overcast on this uh, December day. It is Thursday morning at the landing site uh, just before 11 a.m. Kazakhstan time. We're still awaiting confirmation of landing, but some of the ground vehicles uh, obviously are heading in a direction that would imply that the uh, Soyuz has landed. We're again, we're standing by for confirmation. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, the Russian flight controllers at the Russian Mission Control Center have now confirmed that they have a visual on the vehicle. It has landed in a vertical position. It is upright. So uh, the Soyuz MS-09 stuck the landing on the eve of the 50th anniversary of humankind's first voyage to the moon. A multinational crew returns to Earth after spending more than a half year in space. While on station, the Expedition 57 crew undertook hundreds of experiments covering biology, physics, and Earth sciences, including new cancer treatments and monitoring environmental conditions on the Earth's surface. The crew also installed a new two-person sealed work area called the Life Sciences Glove Box and carried out two EVAs, or extravehicular activities, NASA speak for spacewalks. And the mission wasn't without significant drama. While on station, their Soyuz MS-09 orbital module suddenly developed a leak and began venting atmosphere into space. The leak was quickly located and plugged up using an epoxy resin. It was found to be a hole drilled into the hull of the Soyuz module. Last week, cosmonauts carried out a grueling seven and three quarter hour spacewalk to try and gather evidence for Russian investigators trying to determine the cause of the drill hole. It could have been accidentally drilled while the spacecraft was being manufactured at the inertia plant and then quickly covered up badly. It could just as easily have been done during final assembly at the Baikonur Cosmodrome and again hastily covered up. A third option, one which apparently is being seriously considered by investigators, is that the hole was drilled fresh while in orbit, a prospect which raises some significant alarm. During the spacewalk, cosmonauts discovered a black and yellow furry deposit around the hole on the outside of the module. Samples have been taken, which will now be forensically analysed back on Earth. And the drama didn't end there. The crew were also forced to delay their return to Earth after their replacement Expedition 58 crew were forced to abort their mission to the orbiting outpost. The Expedition 58 crew carried out an emergency high-G ballistic return to Earth aboard their Soyuz MS-10 capsule. The ascent abort was needed after one of the Soyuz FG rocket strap-on liquid fuel boosters failed to jettison cleanly two minutes after launch, instead crashing into and destroying the launch vehicle's core stage. China has launched a new oceanography science satellite. The joint sino french CFASAT satellite was launched aboard a Long March 2C rocket from the Zhaiquan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China's Ganzhou province. The 600kg spacecraft is designed to study the ocean surface winds and waves using two radar instruments. SWIM, the Surface Waves Investigation and Monitoring Instrument, will survey the length, height and direction of waves, while SCAT, the Windfield Scatterometer, will measure the strength and direction of winds. The satellite has been placed into a 520 km high orbit. The Long March 2C also carried seven miniaturized satellites into orbit, including a research satellite developed by Belarus and six small experimental Chinese military satellites. Just weeks later, China carried out another launch from Xiaquan, this time using a Long March 2D rocket to carry five research satellites into a 500 km high sun synchronous orbit. The payload included the Xiaowan Weijing 6 satellite, which will be used for surveillance operations. 
Also aboard were the Tiangping 1A and 1B satellites, which will be used for equipment calibration on ground control stations, the 50kg Jiating-1, which is part of the new privately owned nano telecommunications constellation for low Earth orbit, and the 27kg Tianji-1 satellite, designed to conduct experiments using open-source satellite software research and development on Android platforms. Just days after the Xiaoyang Wanjing 6 launch, China launched another Long March 2D rocket from Xiaquan, this one carrying two Saudi spy satellites. The Saudi Arabian built Saudi Sat 5A and 5B are equipped with hyperspectral imaging systems. The probes are the largest spy satellites ever built by Saudi Arabia. The two 500 kg spacecraft will provide the Saudi military with global high resolution observational capabilities. The flight also carried 10 small Chinese micro and nano satellites, including seven Internet of Things technology verification spacecraft and three experimental remote sensing satellites. Meanwhile, a private Chinese company, Landspace, has failed to place a small satellite into orbit following its own launch from Xiaquan. The 19 metre tall ZHU-Q1 suffered a third stage failure. The three-stage solid fueled rocket is actually a converted DF-26 medium-range ballistic missile, with its usual thermonuclear warhead removed, providing payload capacity for up to 300 kilograms to be placed into a 300 km high low Earth orbit. The mission was carrying the Weili or Future One experimental Earth observation satellite. India has set a new record launching its GSAT-29 telecommunications satellite, the heaviest payload it's ever carried into orbit. The mission was the second developmental flight for its new 44-metre-tall three-stage GSLV Mark III rocket, which lifted off from the Shatish Dhawan Space Centre on the Bay of Bengal coast. The satellite was successfully placed into a geosynchronous transfer orbit 17 minutes after launch. The 3,423kg GSAT-29 was built by the Indian Space Research Organisation using its enhanced 13K bus. This high-throughput multi-beam communication satellite is equipped with both KU and KA band transponders and fitted with several new technologies including both a Q and V band payload and an optical telecommunications data transmission demonstration package. The GSAT-29 will provide communication services to communities in hilly and geographically inaccessible regions of Jammu and Kashmir and across northeastern regions of India. The GSAT-29 was followed just a few weeks later by another GSLV mission, this one carrying the GSAT-7A into geostationary transfer orbit. The 2,250kg spacecraft used the standard 1-2K bus providing KU band communications across the subcontinent. GSAT-7 was the 35th telecommunications satellite built by the Indian Space Research Organisation. A Russian Proton rocket has carried a new military telecommunications satellite into orbit. The launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan placed the Blagovest No. 13L telecommunications satellite into geostationary transfer orbit. The three-stage Proton launch vehicle was equipped with a Brizem upper stage or TUG for this mission. The satellite is equipped with both KU and Q-band transponders. It'll provide telecommunications for the Russian Ministry of Defence for the next 15 years. A fourth Blagovest telecommunication satellite is expected to be launched in 2019. Interestingly, this flight was the first by a Proton rocket in eight months, that mission also placing a Blagovest telecommunication satellite into orbit. It's unusual in that the Proton for a long time was the workhorse of the Russian space fleet, but a series of launch failures have seen less Protons launched than the good old days. SpaceX has set a new American launch record flying 64 satellites on a single mission. The launch was called Spaceflight SSOA, which stands for Small Sat Express to a Low Earth Orbit. The flight blasted off from Space Launch Complex 4 East at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The mission was the third flight for the same Falcon 9 launch vehicle, which then successfully landed on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions, which had been pre-positioned downrange in the North Pacific Ocean. The mission required a series of six separate deployments between 13 and 43 minutes after liftoff, followed by Space Ride Share Company Spaceflight's own deployment sequences over the following six hours. The payload included 15 microsatellites and 49 CubeSats from 34 different clients, including government agencies, private companies and universities, from a total of 17 countries, including the United States, Australia, Finland, Germany, Singapore, Thailand, South Korea, France, Kazakhstan and Switzerland. 
An Ariane 5 rocket has successfully launched two new satellites into orbit. Ariane Space Flight VA246 blasted off from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana, carrying the GSAT-11 and GeoComsat 2A satellites. The 5,854kg Indian Space Research Organization's GSAT-11 telecommunications satellite was deployed into a geostationary transfer orbit 29 minutes after launch. GSAT-11 is equipped with KU and KA bands in both forward and return links, offering a multi-spot beam coverage over the Indian mainland and nearby islands with enough fuel for the next 15 years. It was followed four minutes later by the deployment of the 3,507kg Geocomsat 2A spacecraft for the Korean Aerospace Research Institute. Geocomsat 2A will provide meteorological and space weather monitoring over the Asia-Pacific region for the next 10 or more years. The flight was the 102nd launch of an Ariane 5 and the 6th Ariane 5 mission this year. Just a few weeks later, Ariane Space launched a new Moroccan military spy satellite using its small-capacity Vega rocket. The 1,108kg Mohammed 6B was built by Thales Alenia Space and was deployed into a 604km high sun-synchronous orbit 55 minutes after launch. The new spacecraft will join its sister spy satellite, Mohammed 6A, which was launched last year, providing surveillance for the Moroccan Defence Forces. The European Space Agency's final launch for the year saw a Russian Soyuz STA rocket carry a new French spy satellite into orbit from Kourou. The CSO-1 was flown aboard Ariane Space Mission VS-20. The 3,655kg electro-optical reconnaissance satellite was placed into an 800km high sun-synchronous orbit. CSO-1 is the first of three new spy satellites being launched to replace France's existing Helios-2 military observation satellites. They'll provide very high-resolution imagery down to just 35 centimetres. The next in the series, CSO-2, will fly in 2021, providing even higher resolution down to just 20 centimetres from a 480-kilometre high orbit, while the third satellite, CSO-3, will be a joint Franco-German platform. The launch of the new satellite was viewed with such importance that two French Air Force Raphael fighters, a Boeing C-135 air-to-air refuelling tanker, a Boeing E-3F AWACS radar aircraft and two military helicopters were all deployed to French Guiana to provide special air security protection and surveillance for the launch. The mission also marked the 20th Soyuz launch from Kourou since the Russian rockets began replacing the Ariane 4 from French Guiana in October 2011. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. New researchers found that cancer cells deprived of mitochondria can form tumours. A report in the journal Cell Metabolism has concluded that without the mitochondria, cancer cells can't form new strands of DNA, which means they're unable to grow. Mitochondria are considered a cell's powerhouse. Tumors develop when cancer cells grow, divide and spread, so blocking access to mitochondria may lead to new cancer treatments. A new study has found that the bodies of large dinosaurs with all that meat around them would have been really great at retaining heat, but it would also have put their brains at constant risk of overheating. A report in the journal PLOS One found in chylosaurs, short, stubby, armoured tank-like dinosaurs, appeared to have solved this problem by developing noses that work like air conditioners. Researchers reached their conclusions after making computer simulations of an ankylosaur's nasal passage based on fossils and found that the size and shape of these passages would have allowed the dinosaurs to cool down blood headed for the brain by cooling and drying the air as they exhaled. Archaeologists in Jerusalem have unearthed a 2,000-year-old ring with a solitaire gemstone at an ancient Jewish ritual bath or mikvah at a dig site on the pilgrimage road in the City of David National Park. The ring dates back to around the time of the Second Temple. The ancient paved road runs from the Shiloh Pool to the Temple Mount and is thought to have been the main thoroughfare taken by Jewish pilgrims on their way to the Temple. Archaeologists say that, just like today, it would appear that in the past rings and jewellery were removed before bathing and, sadly, sometimes lost. This ring, along with other finds, is helping to shed light on the day-to-day lives of Jews living at the time of the Second Temple more than 2,000 years ago. 
The City of David National Park is Israel's largest active archaeological site. Situated upon the ancient city of Jerusalem, where, according to the Bible, King David first established Jerusalem as a united capital for Israel more than 3,000 years ago. And finally for now, looks like there could be some benefits to being a crazy cat lady. A report in the journal PLOS One has found that the more cats and dogs you have in a house as a baby, the less likely you are to have asthma or allergies when you grow up. Scientists found that kids who have no pets in the house when they were babies had a 50% greater chance of developing either asthma, allergic rhinoconjunctivitis or eczema as a 7-year-old. But the more pets you have in the house, the risk of allergies dropped off sequentially, reaching zero for those with five or more pets, suggesting some sort of mini-farm effect, where cats and dogs protect against allergy development. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.